much more to me. Are the stories recorded in the Bible real history or just mythology? Archaeology is what helps us to get at the truth. Welcome to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We're on AM 1170, The Answer in San Diego, every Sunday from 4 to 5 p.m. And you can stream the show all over the world at am1170theanswer.com. My website is educateforlife.org. Today we're going to be talking with archaeologist Dr. Scott Stripling. I actually had him on my show back in 2015 on May 10th. If you want to hear a recording of the show I did with him, uh, you can look it up on YouTube. And uh, we actually talked about some amazing finds uh, that he was involved with that have actually validated the Bible. He has a doctorate of ministry with an emphasis in ancient Near Eastern archaeology. And he's also the author of The Trowel and the Truth. And he's the director of ABR's excavations at Kerbet el Makader, which is located nine miles north of Jerusalem, uh, in the disputed territory of Security Zone C. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks for being on the show uh, today, Scott. Glad to be with you, Kevin. Excellent. We also have with us Dr. Bryant Wood, and he was recently featured in the documentary Patterns of Evidence, Scientific Proof for the Exodus. We're going to be talking with him about his involvement there and exactly what that documentary uh, was trying to achieve. He has a PhD degree, a PhD degree in Syro Palestinian Palestinian Archaeology from the University of Toronto. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. Okay, and and he's also a specialized in Canaanite pottery of the Late Bronze Age. He's the author of The Sociology of Pottery in Ancient Palestine, and uh, his credentials are, are a page long. Uh, you've been involved in archaeology for a very long time, Dr. Wood. That's right. Okay. I wanted to ask you both, um, you know, why the interest in archaeology, what drew you to it, and also what caused you to get involved with the Associates for Biblical Research? Um, why did you choose to become a part of this organization? How about uh, Dr. Stripling, if you'd like to start us off? Well, I was driven to the study of archaeology by trying to understand the background of the biblical text. Uh, I had studied it uh, intensively, and the answers that I was seeking, which was sort of the texture, the, the material culture, you know, I, I read in the Bible that they went into a house, but what does a house look like? And those things just were very intriguing to me, and that's what led me to, to get involved in in actually field archaeology, and um, about five years ago, I joined the excavation at Kerbet el Makader, which Dr. Wood had founded back in 1995, and um, uh, three years ago, Dr. Wood turned the reins over to me, and I became the uh, director of the excavation. So uh, about five years ago is when I became involved with Associates for Biblical Research. Okay, and then Dr. Wood, what about yourself? Uh, Do you have a similar story? Well, a little different. Uh, I got hooked on archaeology when my mother-in-law gave me a book for Christmas called uh, The Bible is History by Werner Keller. And uh, at the time, I was working at General Electric Company as a mechanical engineer there, and I was just totally fascinated by all these findings that related to the Bible. It just sort of brought the Bible alive for me as I read about these discoveries. And so that was the beginning, and uh, I I got more and more involved in studying archaeology and relating it to the the Bible uh, until I got to the point where I felt this is what I wanted to really do with uh, my career rather than engineering. So I left the... uh, engineering field. Uh, I had an early midlife crisis. I left GE when I was, I think I was 36 or 37. I went off to school to study archaeology, eventually got the PhD, uh, got involved with the Associates for Biblical Research uh, with their uh, earlier dig at a place called Kerbert Nissia, not too far from Kerbert El Makader. Uh, worked uh, with David Livingston, the founder of uh, the ministry, and uh, then eventually became a staff member of ABR and have been uh, with them for uh, uh, several decades now. So so we really have your mother-in-law to thank for who you've become today. <laughs> yes, indeed, yes. <laughs> That's great. Who says in-laws are all bad, right? So, so um, you know, just to brag on Dr. Wood for our listeners— um, 
he he was very involved in research on ancient Jericho and demonstrating that the historical account of Jericho, the uh, the Jews going into the Hebrews going into uh, the to Canaan, and uh, he's listed in Who's Who in Biblical Studies in Archaeology, 1993. Who's Who in the East, 1995, 1996. Um, so if, if there was anybody, uh, both these guys are very much experts in this area. These are not guys who are new to this or anything, and. Um, you know, on I on the web, a lot of times, or just in conversation, you'll hear people say, um, hey, the Bible's full of mythology, uh, and you can't trust what it says. Uh, but by obviously, by your experience, this is completely fallacious when, when people make this these kinds of statements. Yes, that's true. What we find uh, is that uh, many people make a very superficial uh uh, uh, understanding uh, uh, just based on hearsay and something some professor said or, or something like that. But when you delve into the actual evidence and look at the facts of the matter, uh, they, uh, the archaeological findings always support the Bible. Yeah, it's phenomenal. It's just, and it does so much for a person's faith in trust in God uh, when they they see this kind of information, um, I feel like it brings a lot of conviction to our faith. Um, would you say it's a leap to say, now I had somebody say, just because you find these sorts of things in the ground doesn't mean all of a sudden that the rest of the Bible is true. How would you respond to somebody like that? Dr. Scott? Well, I guess uh, I would say that you have to approach it inductively. Mm -hmm. If we can show you hundreds of examples of synchronisms between the archaeological data and the biblical text, which we can, yeah. uh, at some point a fair-minded person would have to say, this, this is not coincidental and this is not mythological, because we could point out numerous errors, for example, take the mythology of the ancient Romans, and we could show that, demonstrate that it was not historical. Mm -hmm. uh, what we see in the Bible is very much in sync. You, you have a, a synchronism between the two, and uh, I think fair-minded people would have to say that this is real history. Yeah, absolutely. I and, have an example I like to use, Kevin. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned, I have an, a background in engineering, and uh, if uh, a company is producing some sort of a, a product, uh, they want to uh, test to make sure that everything coming off the assembly line meets the specifications, it's impossible to measure and weigh and check every single item if you're producing thousands upon thousands of an item. So uh, what you do, you uh, do what's called a quality control test, and you choose maybe one out of 100 or one out of a t a 200 uh, as they're coming off the assembly line to see if they're within the specifications. If they are, then you can assume all of the product meets the specifications. And we have a similar thing uh, with regard to the Bible and the, the history of the Bible and the archaeological findings. You cannot test and find evidence for every single thing that is mentioned in the Bible, every event or every person or whatever. Uh, and what we have are these discoveries that are like samples from uh, Genesis to Revelation. And every time we get a discovery and we compare it to the Bible, we find that it agrees perfectly. And we continue to make discoveries uh, almost on a weekly basis, it seems. They're just continually being made, and they always agree. And so we can be very confident that the rest of the Bible is going to be uh, shown to be accurate as well, but you can't expect to find something to, uh, you know, to prove every event in the Bible. Yeah, well, that makes a ton of sense. Uh, my guests today are Dr. Scott Stripling and Dr. Bryant Wood, both very, very seasoned archaeologists. They're with the Associates for Biblical Research. Uh, BibleArchaeology.com is their website. You can actually join them in a dig this upcoming summer here uh, if you'd like to over in uh, Jerusalem. And uh, you can be digging up stuff every single day. Christianity is not a religion of mythology. In fact, just recently, Hezekiah's seal was found. And this is a, a, an amazing find, just one of many finds 
throughout the years. But we're going to be discussing this when we come back. Stay with us. We'll be right back. What do leading local restaurants have in common? They depend on Express Fix Coffee for new and used coffee and espresso machines, repairs, and affordable monthly service. Dave Martin and his local team provide water filtration services too. Call San Diego's best espresso repair company, serving your home and business. Learn more online at expressfixcoffee.com. Call Express Fix Coffee at 619-867-3853. 619-867-3853. Hi, this is Jason Hall, president of Team Home Loans, a branch of Synergy One Lending. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Kevin Conover for the profound impact he's had on mine and my wife's spiritual life, as well as being an incredible teacher while our kids were his students. His knowledge and passion have taught us all how important it is to be defenders of our faith. It's our honor and privilege to support Kevin and his show. It is our sincere hope and prayer that you will continue to learn to be defenders of your faith through Kevin's radio show and through his Educate for Life teachings. Thank you, Kevin, from the Hall family and Team Home Loans. Add historic American beauty to your home today with genuine Amish furniture. It's built in the USA from solid cherry wood with a bourbon finish. Or choose alternative woods and finishes to accent your home's decor. You'll find it all at Tucker's Valley Furniture. For over 65 years, the Tucker family has served San Diego County. Still family owned. Cash and Carry and Tucker's Valley Furniture. Two stores, both right across the street at Main and Mollison in El Cajon. Learn more at tuckersvalleyfurniture.com. I will cast my cares on you. You're the anchor of my hope, the only one who's in control. I will Thanks for listening today. This is Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We're on AM 1170, The Answer in San Diego. And we're talking all about archaeology today. We're, we're using archaeology to prove the history that's actually recorded in the Bible. And I've got two experts, uh, expert archaeologists, on the air with me today. And, uh, you know, not too long ago, I posted on my Facebook page, if you, uh, if you want to check it out, Educate for Life, I posted about Hezekiah's seal. This was just recently found. Uh, CNN did an article on it, uh, CNN.com. You can check it out. Dating uh, from the 8th century was discovered in Jerusalem and uh, pretty amazing find. And so I thought, boy, I'd, I'd really like to talk to somebody who knows about this kind of stuff. And so uh, Dr. Stripling, you uh, what, what do you know about this find, and how important of a find is it? Well, it's a fantastic find. A couple of things that are important. Number one, it was found in an archaeological context. It was in a sealed locus. It did not come from a disturbed context, and it did not come from the antiquities market. There had, since the mid-1990s, several Hezekiah seals had been, been brought forth, but they, we don't know the provenance of them, and so that's always problematic. You don't know if they're, they're forgers or, again, what context they came from. Sure. Are forgeries, came from, are forgeries yes, common? Unfortunately, there is a, a big market for that, and you can see why, because, I mean, the Bible is that's as big as it gets. I mean, when you start talking a king like Hezekiah, the Bible says there was no greater king like Hezekiah, you know, before or after. So when you have his name on something, that's big stuff. So what was great about this is it came out of a a sealed context in what we call the Ophel, the area between the city of David and the Temple Mount, where Solomon's uh, royal buildings had been built. And along with 33 other seal impressions, this one was found. And the material was wet sifted, and it's only the, the the little impression, by the way, is only like one centimeter in diameter, so it's very small and easy to miss. But a new technology, which I was actually worked with for two years in Jerusalem, is called wet sifting, taking the material and after it's been sifted and gone through, taking it through a secondary process of wet sifting, and it reveals a tremendous amount. And that it, something as tiny as this, the tip of your finger, really, uh, would have been missed had it not been wet sifted. Yeah, that's and phenomenal. So, well, it's terribly exciting, and it has this four-word inscription in Hebrew. It's sort of a Paleo-Hebrew script. Um, comes across the seven words in English, but Hezekiah, the son of, or belonging to Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah. 
And uh, so there you have two biblical kings mentioned in the same inscription from an 8th century B.C. context. So there again, you have a clear synchronism between the archaeological data and the biblical text. Yeah, now now I know that there are several other finds regarding Hezekiah. I mean, uh, Hezekiah's tunnel is very famous. The Siloam uh, inscription, uh, also the Sennacherib prism. Um, why, why has so much stuff been found regarding uh, Hezekiah and his time? And is this true for other biblical events, uh, other biblical history, or is this uh, kind of an exception with Hezekiah, Dr. Stripper? Well, Hezekiah was a major builder, for one thing. He, he doubled the size of Jerusalem when, when the northern kingdom fell. He came to the throne shortly after the northern kingdom had fallen, and so he had a tremendous influx of population. He enlarged the city, and when he were, he had been a vassal of, uh, of uh, Sargon II, the great Assyrian king, but when Sargon died, uh, Hezekiah rebelled against his successor, Sennacherib, and the Bible records this in great detail in 2 Kings 18 and 2 Chronicles and Isaiah 36, also on the, the uh, prism of Sennacherib, which you mentioned a moment ago, a moment ago. And also in the Siloam inscription in the in what's called Hezekiah's Tunnel in Jerusalem today. So all these these stories are pulled in the Bible, and now we have numerous synchronisms from archaeology that that validate it. Now, how much uh, when when somebody finds? I mean, this like you said, this is only about a centimeter wide. Uh, it's amazing to me that they found it. Uh, how valuable is this? Uh, you know, monetarily, fi- financially. <laughs> well, I mean, if uh, an insurance company asked me recently what what dollar amount they should put on our on our museum display, I said, well, <laughs> you can put whatever amount you want. It's irreplaceable. It's invaluable. So, mm-hmm. uh, I, what it would sell for on the antiquities uh, market, it could be in the millions of dollars, I suppose. But I mean, its value to history is far beyond that. Sure. Um, just the the iconography on it is fascinating. You have. The Ankh on either side. So the Ankh is an Egyptian symbol representing life. And then in the center, you have a winged uh, scarab, a winged sort of a sun disk, if you will, with the wings slightly down. And this is important because that's a symbol from later in Hezekiah's life. And now we can match up those other seals that had come from the antiquities market, and we can compare them and kind of get a chronology and see that later in Hezekiah's life, or maybe halfway through his life, he changed his, his symbols. And then we remember, of course, the story in the Bible, 2 Kings 18, of Hezekiah's life being extended by 15 years. He, yeah. he was told that he was going to die, God extended his life, and then lo and behold, we see that his iconography changes at about that midpoint in his life with the symbols of life on either side of the sun disk. And, of course, remember Malachi says, the son of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. So it's fascinating. Here you have Hebrew script, you have the Egyptian Ankh, and then you have the winged disc, which is more Assyrian in nature. And so you know, even though Hezekiah was a reformer, clearly, uh, there was some level of multiculturalism, at least in the, the iconography that he used. And, sure. and sure. Kevin, this was probably his own personal seal. You have to understand, he that, had a signet yes. ring, and this says that the son of Ahaz, he probably was the one who personally sealed this with his own signet ring. So this is as close as you're going to get to to a great biblical king like Hezekiah. That's amazing. So this is something that he very likely held in his hand, something that he was he owned. Yeah, and let me explain how these are used also. If you had a document, and you were in the 8th century B.C., you had a papyrus document, it would be rolled, and then it would be, you would take a small lump of clay and seal the edge of it, and uh, there would be like a strap, so you'd string of some kind uh, tied around it, and then this clay seal placed over that, and then the ring would impress it, and that's what we're looking at here. Now, what is really interesting is when it's in a fire, of course, the, the, the papyrus will burn up, but the fire hardens the clay, and that's exactly what happened here. Uh, one of the archaeologists, of course, Elat Massad from Hebrew University super, supervised the dig at the Ophel where this was found, but one of her assistants is a good friend of ours named uh, Reut Benadia, 
And uh, Ray Oten was the one who actually cracked the code and, and, and made it clear that who exactly the, this was talking about. But uh, I spoke with her recently about this, and she told me it was very clearly in a fire. And so, you know, what may have seemed like a disaster 2,800 years ago actually preserved this for us to find today. That's fantastic. Now, um, are, are the people that you were just mentioning there, the people that were involved in this dig and this find, are they also a part of the Associates for Biblical Research? No, they're not, but we work cooperatively with them. I was in Jerusalem a few weeks ago, and I met with Dr. Massar. Uh, we're using, they loan us their scanners at Hebrew University to scan some of our artifacts and pottery. Mm -hmm. And then uh, with uh, Reut Ben Adia, we work very closely with her. In fact, uh, we're doing some some, uh, some strategic planning right now about a, a future dig that uh, we're going to be working on. So these, I would say, are colleagues, but they're not part of the Associates for Biblical Research. You know, it's amazing to me. I, I'm very curious how this impacts somebody who, who maybe is uh, non-religious, they're secular-oriented, and how this impacts them when they see these finds and they're holding them in their hands. Does this actually impact them uh, and their attitude towards the Bible and God? Uh, if you have any stories about that. Uh, when we come back, we'll talk more about this. My guests today are Dr. Bryant Wood and also Dr. Scott Stripling of the Associates for Biblical Research. Their website is BibleArchaeology.com, and you can actually... Uh, .org, Kevin. .org, thank you for that correction. BibleArchaeology.org, uh, and you can be involved with what they're doing, whether that's through prayer or uh, financial support or actually going on digs with them in Israel and in the Middle East. So we'll be right back. Stay with us. We've got lots more to talk about. Before I bring my need, I will bring my heart. Not all home inspections are created equal. Joe DeMars and his team at Housemaster have performed inspections in San Diego for 22 years plus and performed over 10,000 inspections for commercial, multiple family, apartments, and residential. Call before you buy or sell. You'll have confidence knowing the true condition of the property. Call 619-660-7866, sandiego.housemaster.com. Home inspections, done right, guaranteed. 619-660-7866. How can you live in San Diego and miss out on enjoying the water? Fast Lane Kayaking sells popular Hobie Cat kayaks that you pedal, not paddle. That means your hands are left free for fishing and fun. Just throw these on your roof rack. They're light and they're easy to use and maintain. Just rinse them off. Try one free on a demo ride. For 36 years, Ron and Debbie Lane have served San Diego with fun, family-friendly water sports of all kinds. Learn more. FastLaneSailing.com. 619-222-0766. I'm giving it all away. No more hiding. No more stalling. I hear you calling me. And I'm calling Thanks for tuning in to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We're on AM 1170, The Answer in San Diego, every Sunday, 4 to 5 p.m. And you can stream the show all over the world at am1170theanswer.com. My guests today are Dr. Bryant Wood and also Dr. Scott Stripling. And we just left off. We were talking about Hezekiah's seal. It was just recently found and uh, an incredible fa a find, really a priceless find uh, on the antiquities market, Dr. Stripling said, uh, potentially worth millions of dollars. And it's only about a centimeter wide. Amazing. But uh, I left off with a question, and I wanted to address this to uh, Dr. Wood. And you're, you've been in, involved in archaeology for so long. In your experience, have you seen people... Um, who who are involved in digs, who are uh, finding, making these discoveries that are confirming the stories that are in the Bible. Have you ever seen anybody's life change as they're they're finding these um, these uh, treasures? Well, unfortunately, uh, on the scholarly level, <clears throat> scholars have uh, pretty well made up their mind with regard to the Bible and and how they view the Bible. And uh, it's very rare when you find that somebody changes their position because of a particular uh, discovery or maybe even uh, many discoveries. Uh, they have some way of rationalizing it. So uh, <laughs> I can't uh, think of any uh, current scholars that have, that have been changed that way. Uh, 
I can remember, remember you mentioned my research on archaeology and on Jericho mm -hmm. uh, when I was studying archaeology at the University of Toronto. And uh, my professor there, uh, when uh, my article was published in Bar and there was a lot of publicity about it, uh, said to me, and of course, uh, my article just just detail the whole list of correlations between the archaeology and the Bible, uh, showing that uh, every detail of the biblical account is borne out by the archaeological findings. Anyway, my professor came up to me and he said, well, he said, maybe, yeah, there was a destruction and, and uh, maybe these things line up. But he says it, it was probably just uh, just a natural earthquake that caused it, and uh, it wasn't a miracle at all. So uh, as much evidence as you could bring before this professor, he was not about to change his mind about the Bible, that, you know, it wasn't super, supernatural, there were no miracles, and most of it is uh, mythology, and he would claim that somebody wrote up a story about Jericho uh, after an earthquake or some natural disaster. Oh, man. Yeah, that's got to be frustrating. Yeah, it, it <laughs> certainly is. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, but for you yourself o over the time, um, this has, for you, increased your conviction that, that the Bible is true. Is that is that right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, every discovery, and even our own discoveries, just... Uh, just support the Bible. And my feeling is that we need to document all of this material that upholds the truth of Scripture for those who are seeking, who have questions, who aren't sure, who maybe have heard some professor say something negative about the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a tremendous amount of evidence that supports the truth of Scripture. So uh, we need to get that evidence out for those who are seeking and want to know the truth. Yeah, absolutely. Now, now you were involved with um, patterns of evidence, Dr. Wood. Um, can you tell us uh, what what is this documentary about? It came out in 2015, and what was the goal of the uh, director as he was... Uh, you know, traveling throughout the Middle East and Egypt and uh, exploring the Exodus, uh, what is he trying to, what are the main points he's trying to refute? I know there's this argument about whether the Jews really were ever slaves in Egypt, uh, whether Moses wrote uh, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, what are the arguments for and against uh, these, the, the biblical history here? And what, what was uh, found in Patterns of Evidence? What's the thesis of that? That movie. Well, that's about a three-hour lecture, Kevin. But I'll, try to, I'll try to boil it down. Uh, the whole issue of the Exodus is probably one of the biggest. Uh, well, I don't like to use the word problem, but to the skeptic and to other scholars, they view it as a as a problem that there is no what we call extra biblical evidence to support the uh, biblical account of the Israelites being in Egypt and then uh, leaving under Moses. Uh, and they say there's no evidence in Egypt for these events. And, of course, what they're talking about is there's no written evidence. There's no documentation that's been found in Egypt that talks about the Israelites or Moses or this group of slaves leaving Egypt. Mm -hmm. Well, the answer to that criticism uh, is, is very uh, uh, clear cut. The Egyptians never recorded anything negative in their histories. The documents that we have, uh, largely inscriptions found in temples, are uh, bragging up the accomplishments of the Pharaoh and how great he was and how great Egypt was, and they will never talk about any failures or defeats. So anyway, that's one side of it, that we cannot expect to find documentation from ancient Egypt. Maybe indirectly, I could talk about that, but not direct evidence. But what we do have, and this is what uh, the producer of Patterns of Evidence was focusing on, we have now evidence from an excavation 
in the delta uh, area of Egypt, in uh, ancient uh, uh, Ramses in that area, eastern delta, for a group of what uh, the uh, excavators call Asiatics, but clearly, uh, when you look at the findings, they were, they were Israelites. So we have now uh, the archaeological evidence for the settlement of the Israelites from the time of Jacob, when he first came into Egypt, all the way down to the uh, time of the Exodus, that whole 430-year period. We now have archaeological uh, documentation for that. And so in the film, uh, the uh, producer was showing how in the Bible we have a pattern of, you know, the Israelites going in as a small group, settling in Ramses in Egypt, growing as a community until uh, when they came out. They were a vast number uh, of people. They uh, sort of were uh, multiplying over those centuries mm -hmm. until a family uh, became a nation. And uh, so there is a pattern that we see in the Bible, and that pattern is what's been found in Egypt, a small group settled in a very uh, humble little village, but then they grew and multiplied, and there's uh, evidence to show that. And then suddenly, in the mid-15th century B.C., uh, they disappear, so to speak, archaeologically. Well, that was the time of the uh, Exodus. In fact, the, the community there, very perhaps prosperous, important uh, community, important for trade, for uh, military uh, reasons, uh, for campaigning uh, to the north, the whole, whole, whole town was abandoned. And we can... Uh, uh, say that that's from from the plagues uh, because Egypt was broken, uh, and so it all lines up very nicely, and that uh, is what has been shown in this film, and uh, it's very well done and uh, on location uh, filming and so on, and uh, it's a very powerful argument uh, to show that yes, the Israelites were there, yes, there was an exodus, just as described in the Bible. Yeah, I, I I watched the whole movie, and I was just uh, enraptured by it. It was amazing. When we get back, we're going to talk a little bit more about this movie, Patterns of Evidence. It's a fantastic movie. I can't recommend it more highly. My guests today are two experts uh, in biblical archaeology, Dr. Scott Stripling, Dr. Bryant Wood of BibleArchaeology.org, the Associates for Biblical Research. Stay with us. We'll be right back as we continue this discussion. When you need tires or service, count on Conover Tires, Wheels, and Service in Oceanside for a full range of affordable options in all the brands you trust. See their great customer reviews and special offers online. Hours Tuesday through Friday, 7.30 to 5.30, and Saturdays, 7.30 to 5. Call Dan and his team at 760-439-1631. Conover Tires, Wheels, and Service, 2405 Oceanside Boulevard in Oceanside, 760-439-1631. Do you have one button espresso machines in your home or business? They make delicious coffee drinks, but they're not maintenance free. Express Fix Coffee is San Diego's source for coffee and espresso machine repair, sales, and service. Call Dave Martin at Express Fix Coffee for new and used espresso machines, repairs, parts, and accessories. They'll save you time and money. Call Express Fix Coffee at 619-867-3853. Learn more at expressfixcoffee.com. There's got to be more than going back and forth From doing right to doing wrong Cause we were taught that's who we are well, come on, get it Welcome to Educate right for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. We're on AM 1170, The Answer in San Diego. My website's educateforlife.org. I've got all kinds of uh, classes on uh, the history of the Bible, who wrote the Bible, uh, why certain books are in the Bible and why other books were kept out of the Bible. All kinds of classes so you can learn all about God's Word. And my guests today, Dr. Scott Stripling and Dr. Bryant Wood, are from the Associates for Biblical Research. And Dr. Scott, I wanted to start off by just uh, giving you the opportunity to share with our listeners 
how they can be involved in an actual dig in Israel this summer. Kevin, we'd love to have your listeners join us. And again, they can access all the information on the web uh, at BibleArchaeology.org, or the website is Makater, M-A-Q-A-T-I-R, Dot org, and all the forms and dates and specifics are there. We have a fantastic excavation just nine miles north of Jerusalem, a tremendous team of uh, scholars that are leading it. So the people who come work with a trained supervisor. We have lectures every evening. We take people on non-working days. We take them touring to other parts of the country to understand the, the larger picture of things. It's a really a life-changing experience. And I would have to say you know, there's many ways to, to learn the land of Israel. Some people talk about, you know, walking the Bible, but we've found a better way. It's called digging the Bible. There we go, yeah. When, when you get it, you know, in your mouth and under your fingernails and in your <laughs> ears and in your eyes, it's literally, you are becoming one with, with the land you are understanding, and it's the volunteers who make the cool discoveries. I mean— we're sitting back supervising and filling out paperwork usually, and they're uncovering things. But, you know, we've had three scarabs in the last three years that are extremely rare and extremely important. One this last summer, one has never been found in Israel. It's the first ever of its kind found in in Israel. And they get to and, they uh, get to they get to keep everything they find, right, <laughs> Doctor Stripley? For a significant <laughs> financial <laughs> donation to the Kerbin Omakata population, of course. Yeah. So uh, they get the bragging right. To be involved. <laughs> they can come for one week, two weeks, three weeks, stay for our post dig tour. And Kevin, we'd love to have you come, and you could bring a group of your listeners also. And wouldn't we could do a live broadcast from Israel? Oh, that'd be great. That'd be great. Okay, I, I got to talk to my wife and and uh, see if she's okay <laughs> with that. I've got three little kids, nine, nine, six, and three. So we'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, Guys, I want to continue this uh, discussion about patterns of evidence. Um, when I watched the movie, I was blown away by some of the findings. Uh, one of the things that really stood out to me was that they that the they believe they've actually found the tomb of Joseph uh, with a little pyramid in the backyard and everything. Um, can you speak to that, Doctor Wood? Uh, yes, there's just been a wealth of uh, material that's come out of these excavations uh, in Egypt at a place called Tel El Daba. That's the modern name. Uh, they began actually back in the mid-1970s. <laughs> have been going on ever since. It's incredible. Now, you've been involved in Egypt arche Egyptian archaeology also for, for a while. Is that correct? Yes, I dug at a, another site in the Delta called Tel El Mascuda, probably biblical Sukkoth, uh, the first stopping place of the Israelites when they uh, uh, left uh, Ramses. Uh, and uh, I visited uh, Tel El Dava several times while I was there, and so uh, I got to know the, the dig director, a man by the name of uh, Manfred Bitek, the uh, excavation is sponsored by uh, Austrians, the University of Vienna, and the government has, or I shouldn't say government, several of their academic institutions, which are funded by the government, uh, have uh, gotten behind this dig, and they've poured, I imagine, millions of dollars. I have no idea, but over these decades, they've put a lot of money into this excavation, and the results have been just almost unbelievable. And, of course, the excavators, they will never admit they're digging up uh, evidence for the exodus. They just talk about an Asiatic settlement and a community <laughs> and so on. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the findings uh, cannot be explained any other way than uh, that it's the Israelites. So now to get back to your question about the statue, this is a fascinating find. It was in a, uh, a tomb, as you say, and uh, the statue itself it was fragmentary. They don't have the whole thing, but they've got the head and the shoulders, and uh, they indicate that this statue was about one and one half uh, life size. So it was a very large statue. Uh, and the likeness of the statue uh, is depicting not a native Egyptian, but an Asiatic, what we would call an Asiatic, someone from Canaan. Uh, and so now that's a bit strange. Uh, obviously, it was someone important. It must have been some uh, 
you know, figure that had status or importance. Otherwise, uh, they wouldn't be making this statue. And it was a very well-made statue, uh, quite uh, certainly coming from the royal uh, workshops that produced the statues of the pharaohs and, and dignitaries and so on. And so uh, some have suggested that this is a statue of Joseph. Well, that's a possibility, I suppose. But uh, in my studies and uh, also uh, a colleague of mine who's been involved uh, in this uh, research, uh, his name is Douglas Petrovich. He's one of our research associates. He's an Egyptologist. Um, he he believes, and I, I think he's right, that it's probably not of Joseph, but of Jacob. Uh, and he has uh, some very strong arguments uh, for that, and we won't go into that, but uh, that would make more sense. Uh, and uh, it was found uh, in, a, in a graveyard uh, of these Asiatics where uh, many grave goods were found indicating they were, you know, not native Egyptians, their pottery, is uh, Canaanite in style. In fact, some of the uh, types of pottery can be traced to the southern uh, part of uh, the land of Israel, uh, where we know Jacob uh, came from. Uh, one of the fascinating things about the cemetery is that uh, many of the burials have donkeys buried uh, in the front of the grave which is seems a little strange, but this was actually a custom that originated in Mesopotamia and was practiced in southern Canaan. Do Egyptians uh, uh, have this, a similar thing? Do oh, they... no, no. This is strictly a, a foreign element. And uh, again, we can relate it to southern Canaan, uh, where, where the Israelites came from. And in fact, going back to the area where they originated, uh, in uh, in Mesopotamia, northern uh, Mesopotamia, and of course the uh, the Israelites uh, used donkeys a lot. Uh, they're mentioned uh, many times in Scripture, and so uh, this animal was very important to them and their economy, and so they just sort of carried on this tradition. And uh, many of the graves have these uh, donkey burials. Wow, that's amazing. My guests today are Dr. Bryant Wood and also Dr. Scott Stripling of the Associates for Biblical Research. That's BibleArchaeology.org. And uh, we're discussing uh, Patterns of Evidence, uh, an incredible documentary. If you haven't seen it, I cannot recommend it more highly, um, confirming the stories in the Bible, specifically the exodus that the Hebrews were in Egypt, that they were slaves in Egypt, and that they left. And uh, we also talked a little bit about Hezekiah's seal, when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about this and um, just kind of talk about the most important finds for these guys as far as what for them has been some of the big points in archaeology that have helped uh, solidify the truth of God's Word. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Jason Hall, president of Team Home Loans, a branch of Synergy One Lending. I just want to take this opportunity to thank Kevin Conover for the profound impact he's had on mine and my wife's spiritual life, as well as being an incredible teacher while our kids were his students. His knowledge and passion have taught us all how important it is to be defenders of our faith. It's our honor and privilege to support Kevin and his show. It is our sincere hope and prayer that you will continue to learn to be defenders of your faith through Kevin's radio show and through his Educate for Life teaching. Thank you, Kevin, from the Hall family and Team Home Loans. In 1947, Gordon Tucker began serving San Diego County families. Today, the family tradition continues with two stores, Tucker's Valley Furniture and Cash and Carry, both right across the street in El Cajon at Maine and Mollison. Whether you want today's modern, eco-friendly furniture or authentic Amish furniture from solid cherry wood built in America, let the Tucker family serve your family. Learn more at tuckersvalleyfurniture.com. A proud sponsor of Educate for Life with Kevin Conover. I will cast by I 
Welcome to Educate for Life. I'm your host, Kevin Conover. My website is educateforlife.org. You can take all kinds of classes on the historical reliability of the Bible. You can take classes on the scientific reliability of the Bible. We've got classes on creation and evolution. Uh, we've got classes on who wrote the Bible, when it was written, um, all kinds of things that will really help to uh, answer the questions that come up commonly, whether you're a high school student or a college student or just somebody who has questions who's trying to find answers. Uh, there's all kinds of uh, answers that are available. And what I find most of the time is that in my own, in my own personal life, usually uh, it's, it's not a lack of answers. It's just uh, me not having uh, looked for the answers and so I might have questions that are able to be answered. I just haven't taken the time to look for them. And uh, my guests today are Dr. Scott Stripling and Dr. Bryant Wood of the Associates for Biblical Research. And if you'd like to buy the movie Patterns of Evidence, which we've been talking about, you can buy it on their website as well as the book that goes with it. And this movie, what it's doing is there's been a movement for quite a while saying that the story of the Exodus in the Bible is not reliable. It doesn't line up properly with what we know of Egyptian archaeology, and Dr. Wood, um, when did this, when did this idea that the archaeological evidence ab about the pharaohs uh, not coinciding with biblical history, when did that argument pop up, and what kind of was the catalyst that that spurred that on? Well, it goes back uh, quite quite a ways, uh, at least to the 1920s. Uh, 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 outstanding uh, scholar from that time period, uh, W.F. Albright, pioneered the idea that the uh, conquest of Canaan took place in the 13th century B.C. Now, according to biblical chronology, the Exodus took place in the mid-15th century B.C., mm. and the conquest would have happened toward the end of the 15th century B.C., several hundred years before this 13th century uh, dating. Uh, and uh, to sort of line up uh, Egyptian history somewhat with this idea of the later dating of the Exodus and Conquest, uh, they used a uh, verse in Exodus chapter 1, verse 11, where it says the Israelites built the store cities of Pethom and Ramses. Well, Ramses, of course, is the name of uh, one of the great uh, pharaohs in Egyptian history, uh, Ramses the Great the great builder. If you visit Egypt, you'll see all kinds of statues and temples and everything that he built. And so they linked that reference in Exodus 111 to the biblical pharaoh Ramses, who did rule in the 13th century. But uh, in order to, to do this, you have to really distort uh, biblical history because, of course, it gives a chronology and it places it much earlier. And you cannot line up uh, the destructions of sites in the 13th century with the destructions we read about in the Bible, primarily Jericho, I, and Hatsor. Uh And so it just doesn't work, but nevertheless, that's been the scholarly uh, thrust as far as the conquest is concerned, and of course many scholars don't believe there ever was an exodus or a conquest, but those who do would put it in the 13th century. Uh, well, the uh, findings in uh, Tel El Daba that we've been talking about uh, provide the uh, data and the evidence that lines up perfectly uh, with the Bible uh, with the earlier dating. Uh, as a result of this uh, scholarly uh, notion that the uh, Exodus took place in the 13th century B.C., uh, Ramses II has become the pharaoh of the Exodus. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and, I mean, you uh, see it in you see it in pop culture movies. Rams yes, yeah. that, that is the Hollywood pharaoh of the Exodus, yeah. and uh, of many scholars as well. Yeah. But that can't be. It just it just does not line up with the Bible, 
And uh, the the pharaoh of the Exodus was no doubt uh, Amenhotep II, who ruled you know around the time uh, that the Israelites uh, left Egypt. Now, are these findings starting to change some people's minds? Are some scholars starting to go, "Hey, we we better take a second look at this." Well, at this point, there has not been uh, much publicity about it. I have written a little bit in our uh, Associates for Biblical Research uh, journal, Bible and Spade, but myself and my colleague that I mentioned uh, earlier, Douglas Petrovich, we're working on uh, some articles and, and even a book to document all these findings and correlate them with the Bible. And once we get that, material out, then others can can interact with that. But right now, the excavators are not making that connection at all. As I mentioned, they just say this is a settlement of Asiatics. Mm -hmm. We can't explain a lot of things. For example, how it suddenly came to an end in the middle of the 15th century B.C. and many other aspects. They simply cannot explain it. But when you use the biblical model Everything lines up beautifully and correlates uh, exactly with what we read in the Bible. Yeah, and that's what I've found in my own, my own research is just time and time again, the Bible's attacked, then vindicated, attacked, then vindicated, attacked, then vindicated. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, uh, Dr. Stripling, I wanted to give you one more chance to um, just talk about the digs and uh, just tell people where they can go and how they can get involved and, and what that process is like and when you're going to be going this this summer, when, what, what are the months and so forth? Okay, well, thanks, Kevin, for having us on today. I think this is just a great discussion, and uh, uh, this is just a sampling of the wealth of resources that folks can find at our website, BibleArchaeology.org. Make that a go-to website. I mean, any question you have about history in the Bible, go, go to BibleArchaeology.org, and there are good, well-written scholarly articles by people who believe the Bible and have done research and first-hand uh, research on these matters. Um, our dig this summer starts on May the 22nd and then runs for three weeks, followed by a post-dig tour. And again, all the details can be accessed at macotter.org, M-A-Q-A-T-I-R.org. And um, if folks have any questions, just shoot them out to us and we'll get right back with you. And we'd love to see you with us uh, in Israel this summer. That's fantastic. Thank you both so much for being on the show today. Uh, I just, I, I think it's such a needed ministry that you guys have. And I, I constantly refer to your site um, just for teaching my classes. I teach high school students. And when they, when they hear this information, it just gives them so much assurance. Um, because you read, you read about things like the Book of Mormon that have no evidence. And a lot of the kids are thinking, well, is that is that the same with my, my religion, you know? Right. And, uh, and yet the Bible has tons of maps, tons of finds, uh, tons of uh, stories that are validated through archaeology. Uh, my guests again today were Dr., uh, Dr. Bryant Wood and Dr. Scott Stripling of the Associates for Biblical Research. You can look them up on BibleArchaeology.org. My website is EducateForLife.org. You're listening to AM 1170, The Answer. We're on the air every Sunday, 4 to 5 p.m., and we'll be back here next week. Stay with us as we answer the difficult questions about the Bible and about life, about God. My hope is that this show encourages you to put your faith, your trust in the Bible. You can build your life upon the rock of God's Word and that it would help you to love God more and love people more. Have a fantastic evening. We'll see you next week.